Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I have a, the unique opportunity that I'm not only the MC who's introducing the next speaker, I actually happen to be the next speaker. So I am going to introduce myself. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker is an amazingly talented and incredibly humble guy. Um, and actually, what I mean by talented is old. I've been doing this for a long time. I started off in computer games in the early 80s, moved into casino games in the 90s, and then for the last few years I've focused on social mobile casino. Now, I'm going to be talking about some big myths and misconceptions about gamblers. And uh, I believe that the last myth will answer probably the biggest question I get from everybody, which is, why would anybody pay to play a slot machine that doesn't pay any money out? I get that question all the time. Hopefully we'll solve that today. Now, at the very first casino track for Casual Connect, I gave a talk. Uh, it was an incredibly popular talk. They put it up on YouTube, and it's gotten almost one dozen views. So you may want to check it out. I talked about the psychology of gambling. Um, and it's one of the things that's very near and dear to me. But today, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the neurology of gambling. Because when you design a casino game, you're not just making the game for the player, you're actually making the game for the player's brain. And the reason I say that is because it turns out that the act of gambling has a physical, measurable effect on the brain. We know that physical changes occur because of this word, and the casino industry hates the word. Um, if you ever talk to any casino professionals, special marketing people, they won't say the word addiction. They hate the word addiction, and in fact, they hate the word gambling. That's why they call it the casino gaming industry. I use the word addiction very specifically and clinically because this is the DSM. It's a diagnostic manual used by psychiatrists and therapists to di diagnose different types of disorders. And Originally, gambling was considered a, an impulse control disorder, similar to when people say they have a, a food addiction or a shopping addiction. But in the DSM-5, gambling was reclassified as a clinical addiction. In fact, it's the only behavioral clinical addiction. It was reclassified in part because of the science and the research that showed that these physical changes were occurring in the brain of a gambler. Uh, there's been studies where they place the gambler inside an MRI machine and they let them play a casino game and they watched areas of their brain light up. And the results were pretty incredible. It turns out that the same areas of the brain were lighting up for a person addicted to gambling as when someone was addicted to heroin. And more importantly, just the thought of gambling, the anticipation of gambling, fired off those same areas of the brain. Anticipation is a hallmark of addiction. Now, one of the primary reasons that the casino industry doesn't like to talk about addiction is they think that once a professional casino game designer like myself knows how to get a person addicted, that that's what I'm going to do. That I'm going to turn to the dark side, I'm going to use my powers for evil, and I'm going to dive into players' brains, and I'm going to reprogram them into mindless, money-spending, gambling robots. In fact, in my upcoming book, actually, I, don't, I wouldn't do a book like that. I actually am not a fan of gambling addiction. Uh, and I actually believe that free-to-play social casino may actually provide a safer alternative to real money gambling for many people. The vast majority of players in free-to-play casino, they stay in the realm of what I call the healthy habit. And they don't go out of control with their spending and I think it's probably because there's a nature to social mobile games. There, you manage the player progression. There's shorter sessions because of mobile. There's wrapping metagames around them. And it regulates the consumption of the gambling games in a way that's very unique. It's very different from brick and mortar casino.
For years, I ran a player research facility, and the one thing that players told us year after year was that they actually liked when they ran out of credits that they had to get up and go to an ATM to get money, because that chance to cool off and think rationally to decide whether they were playing in their budget, um, they liked it. And they said they would never want a slot machine that was directly connected to their bank account where they could just blow money straight from their bank account in the heat of passion, so to speak. This idea of the healthy habit is really important because it's just not good business to have an addict in your casino. Um, you really want players who are gonna slowly build up risk tolerance, steadily increasing their gambling budget. Uh, you don't want somebody who's gonna just immediately go out of control, go broke, and they're forced to quit and not spend anymore. You wanna go to a bar like this. This is my representation of my, my neighborhood pub. Exciting, fun, uh, people interacting with each other, even if it seems a little dangerous. You wanna go to that bar, not the bar where a person's just all he cares about is getting drunk, he doesn't want to talk to anybody, and he's just going to sulk and get drunk alone. So I, I usually talk in a lot of analogies, and for me, the idea is that you want to create this thrilling, exciting roller coaster that figuratively scares people to death, not one that actually does. Now, one note about this, all your players are different. What players find exciting and thrilling initially, they may not find that find it so exciting later. Players evolve over time. So you can't have one experience because sometimes your more mature players, they're not gonna be as excited anymore. Now, one of the reasons that I'm talking about addiction so much in this is just to kind of get into the, into the mindset that this is something that affects the brain, that it's very different from other types of games, and that the games that are played in a real casino Players who play free-to-play have a very similar experience and a very similar psychological and neurological effect when they play these games. Now, there's a fairly derogatory term used privately among a lot of casino gaming professionals, and it describes these hardcore gamblers who, while they aren't addicted, they're definitely not playing for fun and they're not playing for entertainment. They're there to gamble. And most people refer to them as Australians. But what I actually mean is degenerate gamblers. You'll hear people say this privately at parties over drinks when they're talking about slot players. Um, these are players who straddle the, the line between socially acceptable behavior and the vice of gambling. But I think they've been unfairly given the label of degenerate simply because it's hard for people to understand why would somebody who's not playing for fun or entertainment be playing the game? Well, I call these players serious gamblers. And when I talk about serious gamblers, these are these people who spend lots, large blocks of time. They monetize. They're fans of the game. They're not addicts, they're fanatics. So you really want to pay attention to these serious gamblers because they are the players who are bringing in the revenue and they are the players that are most like the casino floor players. All right, now I just said that serious gamblers don't play for fun or entertainment, so that kind of leads me into the four myths and misconceptions. Um, these are things that I've learned over the many, many years I've been working as a casino game designer. So, myth number one is that they have fun gambling. Players don't have fun gambling, they have fun winning. And since a casino game is designed to have you lose more than you win, what's driving them? Um, so to kind of explain that, I want to use another analogy to show that gambling isn't fun, it's pleasurable. And so here's what I mean by that. If you're out swimming, playing on the beach, having a great day, that's fun. But at the end of the day, if you stay out in the sun like that, it's not so fun. Um, now, if you take that and you say, well, when I put some sunburn lotion on, now that is pleasurable. It feels wonderful. It's not fun, but it feels fantastic. The relief of pain, stress, or tension 
is pleasurable, it's not fun. For the serious gambler, it's not fun, it's pleasure. Myth number two, gambling, gambling is pleasurable. Now I know I just said that it was. Um, it's not the actual gambling itself that's pleasurable, it's the relief from the pain and the tension created by gambling that's pleasurable. Now, when you think about it, you're not gonna get near the pleasure of putting sunburn lotion on yourself if you don't have a sunburn. I guess that depends on where you rub it, but if you don't have a sunburn, you don't need that, that pleasure. When you spend money on gambling, spin after spin, card deal after card deal, you're building up pressure, stress, tension, and all that demands relief. So, in America, gas stations sell these huge drinks, basically a bucket with a straw in it, and if you imagine drinking one of those before you get on your drive to work, and then that's what your morning commute looks like, you'll start to understand what I mean by pressure building up. You know, if you're, you're driving and you, you really gotta go, you gotta go, you barely make it into the office, you rush into the nearest toilet, you know the pleasure of relief that I'm talking about. In fact, you know the kind of face that you make when you have that kind of relief. Now, I can, if you were playing Candy Crush on the bus and you made that face every time you cleared a level, I'm pretty sure the bus driver would throw you off. This is important, this is what I'm talking about. The pain of loss, the joy of winning, the anticipation of an unknown outcome. This is what creates tension for the gambler. And it's the relief of that tension that creates the pleasure of gambling. It's just important to remember, pleasure comes from the scratch, not the itch. So, that brings up the next myth. The release of tension is the most important part of the casino game. Well, if that was true, we wouldn't spend all this time making all these graphics, making these slots look and feel like entertaining products, making them feel like a fun sort of game experience. If you, if you say that players love the scratch, it doesn't mean that they want to go find the itch. Saying that people love to gamble because the relief of winning feels so good after the pain of losing is like saying you should hit yourself in the head with a hammer because it feels so good when you stop. But you gotta ask, what is driving players to voluntarily put themselves in a state of tension? What, you know, do they want to create an itch just so they could scratch it? The answer is they don't want to create an itch. It's our job to basically give them a fun, entertaining experience. But in the background, the mathematics are creating all of that tension, that cycle. And if they play that game long enough, the nature of a casino game will create that itch in the background. It's like having fun on the beach, you don't realize you're getting a sunburn. Um, they don't realize that they're starting to build that healthy habit of this thing that's enjoyable for them. Another way to look at it is if you look at a slot game that the entertainment and math experience of a slot machine is like a movie, then mindlessly hitting the spin button is like eating popcorn. If you can keep that movie entertaining enough, well, then the inherent psychological mechanisms of a casino game will all fall into play. Um, the brain has a natural compulsion for pattern recognition, B.F. Skinner's variables rewards the schedules, um, and there's a effect called the Zagarnik effect of incomplete task, which companies like Merca use very well to complete quests and challenges. In fact, if you look at it, every top performing game uses all of these psychological mechanisms. You just need to keep them playing long enough for these things to do their job. So, the big myth. Myth number four, if they can't win money, then it's not gambling. You know, why are they spending money on this? And this is probably the biggest point of contention between myself and my associates in the real money gaming world. I believe that the social casino player is every bit as much a gambler as the real money player on a casino floor. They believe that free-to-play casino is just a pale imitation of the gambling world. In fact, they compare free-to-play like candy cigarettes in a real tobacco world. 
They argue that this is something for casual and novice players to consume until they can get their hands on the real thing. I've said it time and time again. If you ever meet me outside, I'll keep pounding this home. Gambling is not about winning money, it's not about losing money, it's about risking something of value. The risking is what makes it gambling. The risk is where the thrill is coming from. And we know this is true because every day social casino players are risking real money with zero opportunity to win any real money back. And you don't do that unless there's some sort of upside to be gained. Now, this kid is gambling. He just bet his friends that he could pull off a really cool trick and he's risking more than pride. Ooh, he lost the bet. If you take a close look at the behavior of gamblers, you'll see that winning fake money, it isn't all that different from winning real money. Because if you analyze the behavior, you'll see that for gamblers, there's money and then there's money. Often in a real casino, we have gamblers that we call, call cookie jar gamblers. These are players, they go, they put their money in, they gamble with real money, but when they win, that money doesn't go to paying for groceries or you know, paying rent. That goes to their bankroll. That's their gambling money, that's their fun money. When they put that money in, it was money, but when it comes out, it's, it's bankroll money, and they treat that very differently than they do their regular cash. If you look at it, a serious gambler, when they lose, they'll put more money in. They want to recover those losses. When they win, they want to put more money in, increase their bets, and try to make more money. They never really take the money out of that ecosystem of being in the bankroll. In fact, one of the reasons that uh, casinos use chips is it, it already puts them in that frame of mind that this is gambling money. You know, once real currency becomes uh, a chip, it's basically the same thing as credits in a social casino game. So, if you go back again, when real currency undergoes that change in the player's mind and becomes part of a bankroll, it's the same as in social casino. It is a virtual currency, even though they could use it for groceries. So, again, we find that there's very little difference between money and money. And it's because for a serious gambler, gambling winnings are used for more gambling. And that's exactly the same purpose in Social Casino. They're winning so they can gamble more. Um, it's the same benefit. It's the same detriment. It's the same in the player's mind. Whether it's real money or Social Casino, it is gambling. So, I wanna end this talk and see if there's any questions re reiterating kind of this final point that basically social casino, free to play, is the candy cigarettes of gambling. Uh, it's not the candy cigarettes of gambling. It's the e-cigarettes of gambling. It's the vaping of gambling. If you're on a plane, it's the nicotine gum of gambling. It's a convenient, high-tech version of a product that scratches the same itch. So, with that, thank you for your attention. Apologies if there's any Australians here. And uh, if there's any questions. Does this apply to table games as well as uh, slots? Because a lot of your discussion was about slots specifically. The reason or I, how does it change? Yeah, the reason I tend to focus on slots is slots are generally the purest form of gambling in that there is no skill. You can play it with friends or alone. So slot machines tend to uncover the purest psychological effect for a gambler. But there's all sorts of different table games, blackjack, roulette, bingo. Um, I tend to not focus on those as much, but almost all the same things apply. The, the one difference in poker, where you can get a more competitive element, you're kind of commingling true competition 
with the gaming side of it. Uh, I, actually, I actually argue that, that you know, once you get to a certain level of skill, you really are almost in a, uh, in a sporting event type of thing. But uh, yeah, you, you can trace a lot of the same psychological behaviors if, if a person's addicted to blackjack the same as if they're addicted to a slot machine. You talked about different gamblers type during your presentation. Is there a percentage split between them? For example, Australian gamblers, uh, you told about uh, them, uh, is more than cookie jar gamblers. So, so what type of gambler is more like among others? So the, the, it's an interesting thing when you, when you look at the research of players. Like I said, I, I had a, a, a research facility where we would run focus groups and we would bring in 20 to 30 people that all matched a certain criteria that they were this style of gambler. But when they came into the room, there, there didn't look like there was anything common in between them, right? They were all different races, all different ages, all different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, but they were this style of gambler. And when we found the ones that kind of admitted to themselves that they were there for more than just fun, that they did like the thrill of gambling. They were more comfortable monetizing and hanging on to that money. Initially, some of the gamblers, they're kind of shy about it. They, they don't necessarily want to even admit to themselves. And it's kind of one of those things where you're having to talk to two sides of them at the same time. So if a person, if they believe they're there for the fun and the entertainment and the game, and that they're not there for gambling, but the fact is that they really are. You kind of have to, on the top of the table, say, hey, look, here's all this fun, and here's this, and under the table, it's like, hey, here's the, here's the gambling money, you know? So it, it's more complex to deal with those people, but again, the same psychological hooks, hooks follow through. And there are some people, I mean, gambling is about building up risk tolerance, it's like a thermostat, and for some people, it never clicks over. So they never go beyond the fun part, they don't like losing that money and not having it anymore. My wife, for example, she just can't, the, the joy of winning doesn't offset the pain of losing for her. She doesn't find it thrilling, so she's not a gambler. Um, you don't wanna spend a lot of time trying to cater to those people that will never go down this path. That's why I say, if you focus on the serious gambler, that person who loves the thrill, the, they love the chase, they love the risk, you still have a responsibility to give them this fun, entertaining, exciting experience. Like I was saying, that's the movie, but you have to give them that gambling experience because that's what they're there for. You have to um, dive into the, the deep psychological hooks, the deep mathematical hooks, and as long as you can keep them engaged and keep them entertained for that long period of time, you know, the slot mechanics and the, and the bingo mechanics and the poker mechanics will all do their job. And those people who are true gamblers they'll continue to play. It'll become just a regular habit for them. Uh, is it necessary to be a hardcore uh, gambler to create uh, the best uh, gambling game? So it's very interesting. Um, I know a lot of casino game designers, a lot of the top performing slot designers in, in the world, and no two of them are alike. They all come from different backgrounds. Some come from an art background, some come from a, a math background. Some are absolutely hardcore gamblers, some are just casual gamblers. Um, but the one thing that I can say is those people who are really hardcore gamblers, they do tend to have fewer misses, um, but they're very consistent. The, the guys who are not necessarily the hardcore gambler and they're not looking to do this just generic high volatile sort of games, they're willing to take risk and sometimes they discover new types of game features, new types of mechanics. So you really do want to have a, a variety of, of, uh, of gamblers, but it can actually get to become a negative at, at, uh, at some point. There's, there's absolutely a couple game designers in the, in the industry who are just, they are flat out addicted to gambling. And you know, when basically they get a budget to go gamble and they get paid to make gambling games, that's, that's it, they're, uh, you know, they've kind of uh, sold their soul into the industry, so.